in this morning, every one of you should have received a very special gift from me. You should have received something that looked just like this. Did everybody get one? Everybody pulled it. If you did not get one, raise your hand. We want to make sure you get one. There's someone up here, please. This is the gift that will keep on giving. I want you to know, if anyone ever says, no one's ever gave me anything, well, that would not be true. I have given you something. Now, there is some stipulation to this. There are, there are four rules that apply to this gift I've given you today. Gift number one, you need to choose a hand and put it on that hand. By the way, if you're worried, going, I'm allergic to latex, great, this is vinyl. <laughs> so you have no excuse. So choose a hand and put it on a hand. Second, this is your friend. You can do whatever you'd like to do with it. If you want to put a face on every little finger, get a little marker out and draw faces on it. If you want to color it and have fun with it, this is your friend. Everyone say, hello friend. Third, because it's your friend, you are to take wonderful care of it today. You, you, are, you are to make sure that you do not hurt it. No tears, nothing. You take great care of this. You take care of this like you're taking care of my children. All right? By the way, if you take really good care of it, I might let you take care of my children. <laughs> Rule number four. You have to wait till the end to get that one. As you may notice, we've last week we started a, I don't want to call it a series, because it's not a series. We've entered into a time of getting serious with God. And I'll be honest with you, last week I was blown away in both services by the response. I know that it came as a result of all the prayer that's been coming. I know it's come as a result of the time that, that we are spending in God's Word together. And I hope that you are continuing this week to go through the devotions. If you do not have a devotion, you can get them online at our church address. You can get online at my personal blog address. Or you can go out and we have booklets out here. It's really, really important that we do this together. In fact, I've been blown away by the response that I keep getting back, emails and statements, people saying, God is really working in my life. God is teaching me. I don't want you to miss out on what God is doing because God's not doing it just for one, two, or three, or four. He is working and wanting to work in all of our lives. But it's all based upon one passage of Scripture. If my people, who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. I will come. I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. See, God makes a promise to us. He made a promise to the Israelites. He made a promise to all his people. That if we do our part, he will do his part. And let's be honest. There are some of us in this room. We need healing. We need for God to show up and act like God. And I can assure you of this, churches all across America need God to show up and act like God. And so all we're doing is really coming together in prayer, in, in the study of His Word, in, in, in the reading of His Word, coming together saying, God, we need You. We are desperate for You. We don't even know how desperate we really are for Him. But Lord, we, we've got to have you. And so it's all that's coming together. Saying, God, I want you. I need you. Will you make a difference in my life and in the lives of our church? Well, last week we began by looking at the whole concept 
of what does it mean to be God's people. And if you remember, we really broke it down. To be God's people requires two things. One is that we are saved and no longer lost. There are two types of people in the world, saved people, lost people. And we've got to ask, am I lost? I don't care about God. Am I lost but really religious? Or have I had that transaction of faith and now I'm in a relationship with God and then as someone who's saved, I'm not someone saved living in my ability. I'm someone who's saved who's living surrendered. In fact, I, I kind of make the distinction. Many of us in this room, many people that I know are Christians. They think that Christianity is saved and serving. And that's not true. Christianity is saved and surrendered. Christianity is living under the influence of God. Allowing His Spirit to lead us. Allowing His Spirit to have His influence on us. I'm going to kill myself this morning and all this stuff laying around that I put out there. <laughs> well, last week when we began our series, we actually left the stage bare. You might have noticed. I know that some of you noticed because I had a lot of people come to me and say, why is the stage bare? Because we wanted a visual reminder of how important it is that we have clean, a clean life before God. That we're not weighed down by all the junk. Well, this morning, as you can see, we have a lot of junk. And most of this is cow's junk. <laughs> it's just stuff. It's clutter. And, and so many of us, if we were to be honest, this is what our spiritual lives look like. It's just stuff full of junk, stuff we don't need, stuff that we once thought was fun, but now we don't need it anymore. Just clutter. I don't know about you, but um, I'm not a big fan of clutter. In fact, have you ever, have you seen the show Hoarders? Gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't know what heebie-jeebies are, but I know it gives them to me, okay? That show, ooh. That is, it, it just freaks me out. One reason it freaks me out was several years ago when I was pastoring in Tennessee, I came, I, I, there was a family that lived across the street from our church. They actually, we bought the property our church lived on from them, but it was a very bizarre family. In fact, they enjoyed being kind of toxic toward our church. They would actually call up and say, can we have a staff member come see us or a deacon come see us? And we would go over there, and as soon as we got on the property, they'd call the police for us trespassing. Oh, yeah, bizarre. They would do things like it would be in the middle of the day, and there's really nothing going to our church, and they would call the church, they would call the police and say we were disturbing the peace because we had people at church. Well, what happened one day was the mom, who really was a very sweet lady, she passed away. And source this time they called and said, our mom has passed away, can, can someone from the church come and be with us? So I go over, and I knock on the door, and I've never seen anything like it. They open the door, and from the floor to the ceiling, books, and magazines, and trash, and furniture, and literally, when I walked in the front door, I had to walk through a little path that wound through, and the path was no wider than that. It was in every room of the house. You literally, I walked past one of the bedrooms, and there was a little path, and there was nothing on the bed, but the rest of the room was from floor to ceiling, trash and junk. And then as I walked through the living room, there was a little path to the couch, and you could sit down on the couch, but there was stuff stacked up to about this level, and then all around the side, and the only thing that was not was that was still visible was the television screen. The son who had some real challenges, he, he still was able to drive. And what he would do is he would get in his car, and whenever he got mail or trash, he'd just throw on the floorboard, and literally it stacked up. You could be driving down the road, 
and the only thing you could see is a little hole here and a little hole out front. The rest of the car was full of trash. And what he would do is when the car got to the point in which there was too much trash that he could no longer stay out the window, he parked the car and bought a new car and started all over. There were seven cars parked in their yard. Now, to be honest with you, you don't really know whether to laugh or scoff at such a notion, do you? I mean, it's, it's bizarre. And yet, while we might not live like that, the reality is, is that so many people, while we don't physically live, that, live like that, we live that way spiritually. We go through life and, and we have all this hurt and all this pain and, and we make mistakes. And instead of dealing with it correctly, did I fail to mention that we're all born with a garbage bag? And what we do is we walk through life and something happens and we throw it in our bag. We drag it around a little bit and then something else will happen. We throw it in the bag. Then we have regret. Somebody hurts us. We have all types of things that we keep stuffing into this bag. And we just drag it around. And people see it. Our spouse sees it. Our children see it. And they'll say, why are you doing that? And here's what's crazy about it. We'll go, doing what? What are you talking about? Dad, all that hurt that you're going through, why do you, why do you carry it? Why are you continue to carry it around? What hurt? What regret? And then what we do, when our bag gets full, we tie it off. Throw it on the pile. And we get another garbage bag. And we continue to all this through life. And, and truthfully, we've got to learn how to deal with this. Most of us, we deal with it kind of like Saul, King Saul. You remember King Saul? King Saul did crazy things. Here he was, the anointed of God. God set him in the place to be the king. And instead of consulting God... When they came to Goliath, he ran and hid in his tent. He didn't trust God. He trusted in what he could see. Not in the God who was in control. And he did all types of things. Like one time, God told him to do something. And he says, you know what? God's not working on my time schedule. I'm going to do it myself. And he completely disobeyed God. And God sent Samuel to him and said, listen, you blew it. God's going to raise up someone else because you can't seem to understand what it means to follow God. And then he does something even crazier. He goes and consults a witch because Samuel was no longer available to him. You know what Saul did? You know what? When we have a Saul mentality and it comes to sin and it comes to regret and it comes to mistakes, we have this huge pile, but here's what we do you see nothing. There's no problem here. And the truth is, it's smothering our lives. It's killing us. And we try to trick everyone else that we have no real issues. But here's the thing. We know, and God knows, that there's all this junk that is keeping us from experiencing life as God intends. And every one of us in this room right now, you could probably sit back and start saying, yeah, I know what that is. And I know what it's doing to me. And we've got to learn how to deal with it. And that's one reason God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from 
their wicked ways. Turn from the, the things that are holding them down and weighing them down. He says if we turn from them, then He can do something in our lives. The second thing we can do, if we had to have a choice to serve like, to, to handle like, the, like King Saul, or we can handle it like King David. Well, let's talk about David for a second. If you don't know the story of King David, he was a man after God's own heart. God had done amazing things in his life. In fact, it started out that he was a shepherd boy and he would sit on the side of a hill as he'd watch the sheep and he'd play his little guitar and he would sing songs to God. He wrote songs to God. He, he literally poured his house. He was a man, as God says, a man after my own heart. He probably had as intimate a relationship with God as anyone will see in Scripture. And God had his hand on him. The first time that we see God really work in his life is that he gets faced with a, with a bear and literally slays it with his own bare hands. The second time we see is when Samuel comes to find this new king and he looks at all of his brothers and he says, Eliab, that, that ought to be the guy. Look at him. He's so big. He's so strong. Everyone will respond to him. And God says, no, don't look at the outward appearance, but rather God looks at the heart. And so Saul, Samuel says, do you have anybody else? And they bring David in. And as soon as David walks in the door, God says to Samuel, that's the man because he has a heart that is pure for me. And then we see him stand up and, and, and slay Goliath. Because he trusted more in his God than he did in the giant that was standing in front of him. I mean, we see a man in David that's just unbelievable. And then when he becomes king, he blows it big time. In fact, I dare say there's not one person in this room who has done something in the eyes of man that is more detestable, that is more grotesque, that is greater a sin than David. He lied. He lusted. He committed adultery. He conspired. And then he murdered Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. And tried to cover it all up. And then when God confronts him, instead of doing like Saul, you see nothing. He is broken. And when we come to Psalm 51, we see a man who truly is desperate for God. Listen to this, how Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So you are right when you're so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. So God, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice hide your face from my sins blot out all my iniquity and watch this and God create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me but restore to me the joy of your salvation and a willing spirit to sustain me let me tell you I don't know how many times I've read this psalm. I don't know how many times I've prayed this psalm. This week was the first time I've ever studied this psalm. And God has radically, radically blown me away. This isn't a band-aid. This isn't I've made a mistake. God, will you cover it up? This is the greatest plea for repentance. A greatest plea I've ever read in my life now that I understand it. 
And I want to share, I want to teach you this morning what really is going on in this text to help us to understand what God is really looking for in confession and in repentance. What He's really looking for when it says that we turn from our wicked ways. There are four things I want to show you very quickly this morning. First is the conviction. See, if we're ever going to have a growing, intimate relationship with God, it's going to require that we understand who we are and what we're capable of doing in light of who God is, in light of His holiness. But I'm going to be honest with you. I think that most of us and most people, we think that we're good enough. We don't think that we're really that bad. And the truth is, we are dirty, rotten, filthy, no good, scallywag sinners. Aren't you glad you came to church to hear that today? There is none righteous, no, not one. There's not one who seeks after God. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I don't know that we often really believe that. I think that we think we're okay. I think that we can do, I think many people think that we're good enough that God's going to say, oh, you're okay. And that's not true. You and I will never come to true repentance until we realize how sinful and how desperate we really are for God. And so as we come here, look what he says. Have mercy on me, God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I mean, David is acknowledging that he has stepped across the line. He's acknowledging, I have blown it. He has taken responsibility for his actions in the light of who God is, what God's will is, what God's word is, what God's spirit is. He is saying, I have blown it. How do I know that? Three words. Why in the world would you use transgressions, iniquity, and the word sin? Aren't they all the same? Well, no, they're not. Look at this with me. The first word he says is transgression. The the Hebrew word is pesha, P-E-S-H-A. And what it means, a transgression is an intentional act It's like God says, here's the line. Do not step across this line. This is the boundary. And it's not just going, okay, there's the boundary. It's going, I don't care there's a boundary. What do you think about that, God? That's literally what he's saying. He's saying it's to know what's right. It's to know what's of God. And then it's to intentionally step across it And to say, I don't care what you think, God. And let me assure you, every one of us in this room, whether we've done it so defiantly or not, there have been times in our life that we know that God says, don't step across this line, and we do it anyway. Don't we? It is the act of sinning. The second word he uses is the word iniquity. And it literally means to be depraved. To be perverted, not perverted in the sense of of way out the deep end. It's it's perverted in the sense that it's not what God intended. It's not God's best. And so David's saying, listen, I stepped across the line because I am born depraved. I am a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I have sinned. And so he understands that, that he's not just someone who committed a bad act, that rather, deep down, he is sinful to the core, that he was born a sinner. And he is owning up to that. He has taken responsibility for that. And then he uses the word sin. This is the identifying that I have missed the mark of perfection. It's shatah in the, in the Hebrew. He's saying, I have missed the mark. I know that I am sinful. I know that when my life is thrust against the holiness of God, that I missed the target. And so David, what is he doing? He is under conviction. He is saying, I am a sinner. 
And I can't do anything about it. I am hopeless. I am helpless. And so he's throwing himself to, before God and he's saying, God, I don't have a chance unless you step in. And that gets to the second thing. In, in verse 3 he says, For I know my transgression, my sin is always before me. Against you, God, and you only, have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. See, confession is when we take an honest look at our lives in the light of the holiness of God. It's when we say, God, I know what I'm doing. I know my sin. And what confession really is, confession is admitting an awareness of sin. And it's agreeing that it's sin. It's agreeing with God that it's sin. And so what happens is when we start confessing, we lay these things out and we say, God, here's what this is. And I know it's not your will. But God, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. And so, and we literally go through and we identify every single item. And we name it before God and we say, God, I understand what this is doing to me. In other words, confession is when <laughs> it's letting God know that we know that he knows that we know that what we're doing is not in alignment with his heart. You understand that? It's letting God know that we know that he knows that we know that what we're doing is not right with him. And so we're going through and we're, we're, we're saying, here are these things that are hurting me, God. Here are these things that are, that are an encumbrance to my life. And so, God, I'm gonna, I want to identify them to you because I know what they're doing to me. So we confess it. Now, here's the big thing about confession. Every one of us in this room, our sin affects, effects, and infects other people. You understand that? It affects, effects, and infects. But I cannot sin against you. And you cannot sin against me. Why? Because I'm not holy. And you're not holy. And so David says, God is against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. The prodigal son says the same thing when he comes back to the father. When we sin, I, we sin against God because he is the holy righteous standard. But our sin always infects, affects, and infects other people. And we'll deal with that later. But the point is, we need to understand who God is. He is holy, holy, holy. He is just. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is loving. But above all those things, He is holy, holy, holy. And here we are, sinful people, sinful from birth. We can't do anything to stop it. And God says, you need to confess it. You need to identify what it is that's hurting you, that's holding you back, that's smothering you. The things that you're, you and I are dragging through life, we've got to confess them. But more than just confess, more than just coming to an agreement with God, we have to move to the next level, just like David did. And that's the level of contrition, the level of repentance. See, confession is realizing and admitting to God that what we did, name it for God by repentance, is leaving the clutter and moving towards God. Repentance. It literally means to turn about, to turn away, to make a 180. So I'm go, I've been walking this way and literally it means to turn from it and to walk towards God. Repentance isn't just to turn away and do something else. Repentance is to, confession is to identify it and realize what it's doing to you, repentance is to turn and to go right back to God. Does that make sense? Are you with me? And so he's saying in this text, 
he's saying, listen, you have to confess. You have to get right. Look at this. This is real. This is what God blew me away. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. God, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. He starts out and he says, cleanse me. The word cleanse, it doesn't mean here, it doesn't mean just to rub it and to, and to like I take a dirty dish and clean it off. It literally means to descend. It means to purge, to take it away as if it was never there. So if, if, if like I had a stain in a piece of clothing, it, it's not that, 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 that there's any remnant, any residue of that stain left. It is gone. Completely gone. As far as the east is from the west, it is gone. That's what he is praying. Now here's what's really interesting. Have you ever wondered what the phrase, cleanse me with hyssop means? Has that ever jumped off the page? What is hyssop? This is where it gets really, really interesting. Hyssop was a little plant that's found in the rocks. The first time we see it in Scripture, though, is when the people are in Egypt. In Exodus chapter, I think it's chapter 12, verse 22. And he tells the Israelites to, when, when, when they get to the Passover, he says, make a sacrifice and take hyssop, dip it into the blood, and use that to paint the blood over the doorpost. And from that point on, hyssop was used in every sacrificial service. It was the sponge that used to wipe the blood, to wipe the atoning blood over the lives of the people. And so David, when he comes up, he's literally saying, God, cleanse me with hyssop, purge me. Lord, would you paint your blood over the doorpost of my life so that the death angel will not visit me? So that I can be set free just like the people just like the Israelites were from Egypt. That's not just any prayer, folks. That is truly throwing yourself on the mercy of God. He's not worried about the judgment. He is worried about not having God in his life. He's worried about missing God. So he says, cleanse me with hyssop. Then he steps up and he says, and wash me. The word wash, it's a continuation of the ceremonial cleansing. And what he's really saying is, God, I can't cleanse myself. I can't get rid of this stain. Only you can do it. The word wash, the, the, if you translate it over to the Greek, it literally means propitiation. And the word propitiation means a satisfactory sacrifice. In all of history, there's only been one satisfactory sacrifice. One sacrifice that can absolutely atone. Do you know what that was? Jesus. David is saying, God, I have no hope unless you cleanse me. And then he uses the word blot out. The word blot out literally means to cut it away as if it never existed. And so David goes from, from, from conviction to to confession, God, here are the issues in my life, to then saying, God, I have no chance without this. I am hopeless. And Lord, would you step in? Would you step in and cleanse me? Because unless you step in, I can't be clean. Did you hear that? Unless God steps in, there's not one of us in this room that can be clean from the junk and the stain of sin and hurt and regret and remorse. And then my favorite part of this whole song. When he reconnects with God. And he prays, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You know what he's praying for? This is really interesting. He's praying that God would make him a new creation. Do you know that happens at salvation? 2 Corinthians 5.17 
It, it tells us if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. The word here that David uses is the word bara. And it goes back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created something from nothing. And so David says, God created me something from nothing. Don't take this heart that I have, but God give me a completely brand new heart. Create in me a new heart, O oh God. And then renew a right spirit. Cast me not from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. But restore to me. The word restore means to make it like it was before. What was David's life before? When he would sit on the side of that hill watching the sheep. Playing his harp or his guitar or whatever he's playing. Worshiping God. When he thought back to all those times that God had his hand upon his life when he was so close to God that he could taste it. That's what he's praying for. He's saying, God, I want a new heart so that I can have a new relationship with you. I have royally blown it, but I am tired of dragging all this stuff around. Creating me a clean heart. As I close this morning, I want to take you to a psalm. Psalm 24, 3 and 4. In this psalm, David asked a really great question. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Only the one who has clean hands, a pure heart, and who does, and who does not trust in an idol or swear by what is false. Who may ascend? I'll tell you who can ascend. Not one of us in this room. In our ability. In our strength. With our clutter. Not one of us. The only one who can ascend is the one who has experienced the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That's it. I wonder deep in your soul how much junk is there. If your life were a box truck and someone rolled back the door what would they see? Would it be a truck full of junk? Or would it be clean? Watch this.
Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit. Cast me not from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. But restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I wonder. What is crowding your soul? What is obscuring the throne of your life? The only solution is to confess it, to come into an agreement with God, identify it, and then appeal to His mercy and ask Him to take it away. And the Bible says if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says as far as the east is from the west, He'll take our sin and it'll go away. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. As we go into our invitation today, I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to think about your life. What in you hurt, pain, sin, regret, remorse, what is it that you've been dragging around that today you can identify it and turn from it so that you can be clean before God? The altar is open for you to respond as God leads you. To join our church, to come into Christ, or simply to come and kneel and to deal with whatever God